I started entertaining in 2010. So it's been 12 years this year. This year made 12 years. Okay. Did you ever do drag? Well, I, I've never done a like drag officially. I did a, um, a house pageant back in the day before I started med entertainment. I started med entertainment in 2010. And I think I did like the house pageant like 2007, 2008. Um, and it was just, it was just something that I entered just to do. Um, it was something here in the community and it was a house pageant. Um, but only thing that it was different was you still you didn't have to worry about doing household items. You still did presentation. Um, it had to be like the color of the HIV, like the um, HIV awareness, um, something like that. So it had to be like red or black. Um, talent was regular talent, and then it was um, only sportswear. I don't think it was gown. Yeah, it was presentation, talent, sportswear. Um, and so I did it and, um, you know, they were, so I really wasn't really putting too much effort into it, but I had a couple of other people that were doing it that had already been doing drag. And so they were like, oh, you're not going to win. You go, oh, you're going to be the laughing stock. So I'm like, okay, so once you really test me, then I'm going to go ahead and I reached out to a, des a designer, my brother, this um, El Cabanage, Michael Sales Designs. Um, I said, we got to get a presentation. I need to get a sportswear because I'm going to show them I'm going to really do this. And I did it and won the pageant. <laughs> you know, Amari, I want to say this here because I think it needs to be said. And the Black community and the Black gay community needs to understand that they are a powerful source hiding underneath greatness. They have been doing so many beautiful costumes. They do yeah. makeup and hair. These our community should be very wealthy beyond belief. And I'm seeing this, there, there's now a real pushback now. And I don't think it's even so much about the Republicans and what's happening with the voting. I think it's more about they now realize that we have been ignored a very long time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I feel like we're breaking barriers. Um, you know, the barriers that has been up for years, for decades. I'm, I'm glad that we're finally taking a stance and, and, and we're knocking those barriers down because, you know, we didn't have opportunities back then that we have now. And even now, sometimes a lot of opportunities aren't given to us. So we have to take the opportunity. And once we take those opportunities, then that's when, that's when others are going to follow. And then that's when we can, of course, stand strong, united. Mm -hmm. Now, let's talk about the former titles that you have. You're a former um, Mr. Black Continental, um, Mr. Sweetheart International, and uh, Mr. Black, um, it says, I can't read what she wrote here. I think it's <laughs> Emperor. I think it's Emperor. Yeah, so my nationals, as far as my former national titles, yeah, former Mr. Black Continental at large, a former mm -hmm. Mr. Sweetheart International at large. Um, I'm a former North America Supreme and a former Westland Grand Emperor. So those are my four national titles that I've ranged for on the at-large system. Um, mm -hmm. And then National Showman is my fifth national title. And it's my first national title as a regular division Um King, you know, we have that large, the regular. So I have four national and large titles and national showman is my first and fifth national title. First national title in the, in the, in the, with those skinny boys. Let them know. We're, I'm, I'm no. here now, this division. <laughs> well, I was going to ask you about that. You know, there's also been a, a lot of talk about the bigger men in pageantry. Now, do you feel inadequate when you, let's say when you go into one of these pageants, because I've seen some of the Mr. Continental pluses and they don't look, you know, plus to me. I mean, mm -hmm. even though they, I mean, they're tall and all that. So I see where the weight is at. But right. when you think you compare yourself to them, how do you feel when you, because in plus you would think everybody would be really normally you would see everybody that is really a plus size person. Right. And, and so, and that's where I, it's so not that way. It's, it's, 
because what is plus? Like plus does not have a picture in the definition next to, I mean, a picture in the dictionary next to it, you know? So you have to only follow the guidelines that that pageant holds or requires for plus and at large. So if their guidelines are 200 pounds or um, 6'2 or six feet in height, that's a guideline. So that means for that particular pageant, you meet the guidelines and you qualify. So I don't think plus has to, you know, be looked at as you have to be fat, out of shape, large, you know, juicy. Mm-hmm. I don't think that. But, but as that's that's the biggest misconception with plus and at large um, in, in the plus and at large arena is many people, the, the patrons and the the community that's watching on, they're looking like, oh, that's not plus. Well, what is what is plus? Because this guideline says as long as I'm 200 pounds, I can do the plus division. But I've never felt like even when I was in the plus division or at large division, I never felt. And and more than most times, I were I was the skinnier this of of the of the contestants that I competed against. Sometimes, not all the times, um, because I had got pretty big. I was at like almost two hundred and fifty five pounds. Like I was pretty big, and so when I was still doing the regular division, I felt like at that time I did have a disadvantage because now my clothes are getting a little bit tighter. The guys are coming with swimsuits, and I can't wear swimsuits, so I'm wearing clothes, and so. It, at that point, that large division was the, the best step for me to take. Um, and that was even hard for me to step up to do the at large because I, I had already been doing regular regular boy pageants. I, I've i won skinny boy pageants before my nationals. Um, I won King of Hearts, which is now Peak State. Um, I've won a, a Mr. Capital City International in Virginia. Um, and even then, I went against some good boys like Lavelle, Babyface Houston, um, Rio Blue, um, in Virginia, and I was successful that night for Mr. Capital City International. Um, so I've competed Mr. Floyd Extravaganza here. Um, so I've competed in skating boy pageants that I was successful at winning. Um, it was just over the years gaining that weight and getting bigger, clothes getting tighter. Then here I'm looking into that large pageants, and I was like, oh, no, because they're going to read me. They're going to think I'm just trying to go take the easy ride out. And I remember Tanisha Cassidine, um, I mm. talked to her about it. And because um, she lived here in Tampa, we're very close. Um, she lived here in Tampa as well. And I was at her house and I was like, Queen, because we, we uh, Mr. GQ, we won GQ together. I was Mr. GQ and she was Miss um, Forever Bad. So um, I was like, Queen, um, I want to get back out there. But I just think that I've been looking at that large pageants, but I don't want them to think I'm just trying to be skinny and go to a large and get a title. She was her exact word. She was like, King, go get all that shit. Do it all. I do Miss Duval and Miss Duval Plus. I do Continental Plus and Miss Continental. It doesn't matter. She was like, I'm Continental Plus, but Jim Flint, Jim Flint calls to the stage, Continental to the stage. He does not call Continental Plus to the stage or Continental Elite to the stage. Whenever you're Continental, you're Continental. So I was like, well, that's a good way of looking at it. She was like, yeah, so if you want to go be sweetheart, it doesn't matter if you do sweetheart, sweetheart at large, you'll be sweetheart. So after that conversation that we had, it really helped make my decision to go ahead and step into the large arena. Um, I talked to Antoinette Ch- Chanel Roberts and Kyla Santi, because at first, my husband, he was against it. He was like, no, <laughs> like he flat out told me no. <laughs> um, but... <laughs> Let's I let's mean, talk about something that when you mentioned, you know, that you live in Tampa, mm-hmm. let's talk about boots on the ground. This is what I call it, boots on the ground. What the gay community is doing to help its own community in Tampa. I see that Miss Reva Black is doing a lot. I don't know if you know who she is. Yeah, of course. I know Miss Reva Black for many, many years, and I had to push her. To, to do a few things that I thought would improve her life. And we are good friends until this day. Uh-huh. Now, um, what is the gay community and what is the former Mr. Black Continental, Mr. Sweetheart International, what are you guys doing for the gay community? How does, how does all of this pageantry contribute back into the gay community? I'm not going to say the Black community because we're not... Mm-hmm. We're, the black community, we're a whole community of right. different races and, right. and 
Melodies well, I mean, I do a lot. I do a lot for the community, and 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 I do it selflessly. Like I don't like I'm I'm gonna. I have a show, my own show. So I have a lavish hip hop Thursday, um, nightclub here, um, a night at a club here, City Side Lounge every Thursday night. So I'm able to give um, opportunities for other entertainers to perform and and get a start. Like I tell, mm-hmm. um, I, I post on Facebook all the time. I'm not looking for you know, the best of the best to come and entertain. I'm looking at, looking for the entertainers who just feel like they can't get booked somewhere so they can't touch a stage. We have, a, my stage is open to all, you know, come on, come do a show. You know, if, you, if this is your first show, come do a show because this can be the platform that you may need that because then get you seen by other show directors and then say, oh, I want you to perform, you know, and open up doors that way. Um, I'm also very involved with um, Midway Specialty Care Center. Um, That's one of our nonprofit organizations here that um, specialize in HIV testing and STD testing, STIs, um, vaccines. They're they're like, they just had a outreach last night and they were doing monkeypox vaccines. Um, So Tariko, um, Tariko Ross, he is actually the director at Midway Specialty Care. Kyla Sante, she's um, one of the outreach specialists there. So I work hand I volunteer with them. I even have them come and they do testing on my club night on Thursday nights, free testing, free condoms, um, all that stuff. So, and even with our Tampa Pride, when it's Tampa Pride every year for the Tampa Pride, I'm on the committee, I volunteer to the um, Tampa Pride committee with organizing the Pride, the whole parade and all that stuff. So I make sure that I'm, I'm definitely um, remaining visible in my city because it's beyond the titles and the accolades and things like that. Um, it's, it's really about what are you doing after. Okay, I'm gonna ask you one more question and then we're gonna proceed further into about you and your life. Okay, I wanna talk about the black community um, in, in sense of, I see the real pushback now with the Black community. And I mean, they we have done so much in the world. And it's great to see people now moving, moving their asses and, you know, being very visible, like you said. Now, let's talk about your, I, watching the internet and, and watching a lot of the shows, she wrote here that she sees a predominantly Black, audience, regardless of if it's, we understand Atlanta is a Black city. So we understand the large population of Black patrons to support the contestants for the pageants and the shows and all of this. But you living in Tampa and the surrounding areas, where is that white audience? Why are they not attending these very visible shows that we are filming and showing on social media? Well, I think on my Thursday night, it's actually very diverse um, at Cityside Lounge because really I have the only Black night there. I have a hip hop Thursday. So all the other nights are predominantly Caucasian nights. And I think they have a Latin night on Sunday. So on Thursday, I have a very diverse audience. Like I have more Caucasians and Latins. And even this past Thursday, there was a Chinese patron there and he had the time of his life. I mean, drinking. I mean, because we don't change our music. It's a hip hop Thursday night. It's a hip hop night. Mm-hmm. So we we stay true to the to the night for the music. I mean, and he was dancing. I, I shouted I shouted him out on the microphone because I enjoyed seeing, you know, other ethnicities that are there enjoying themselves other than just predominantly black people. So um and then also I work at Southern Knights Tampa in Ebor City. And that is very diverse. Um, Kyla Sainte hosts the show there. Um, and whenever I'm booked there, sometimes once a month I'm booked there. And well, it's, tell Stephanie Chappé I said hello. Who is it? Tell Stephanie Chappé I said hello. Stephanie Chappé, she's at Southern mm-hmm. Nights. I she's will. A, she's in Ebor City, I think, somewhere over there working. Ebor City. Okay. So, yeah, I, I, Stephanie Chappé. I'll see what, maybe she's at Bradley's. Um, but yeah, so clubs like Southern Knights and Bradley's, now they're definitely more diverse and predominantly um, Caucasians um, go there. But we do, they don't really have like a hip hop night or anything like that. So you really wouldn't see too many, you know, blacks there. But I know at Southern Nights, we definitely go to Southern Nights pretty often on Friday nights, Saturday nights. 
Um, so we're trying to bridge the gap. We, we definitely do. I know between my night and Southern nights, it's they we're, we're definitely you see more of a diverse crowd between those two clubs. OK, let's talk about this and then we'll get into your your life. What do you think of RuPaul's Drag Race? And down the road, I mean, I'm hearing several different things, but we're not going to talk about rumors because that's not what we do. We wait until we see what exactly what is what, and then we we talk about it. I want to talk to you about RuPaul's Drag Race, the impact it has had, both good and really bad, on some levels mm -hmm. for our community. So, what does Mister? national showmen think of that show so for to me i love it i i get jealous that they haven't had a mister uh, <laughs> some sort of rupaul's drag king or something like that uh, because i think it's an amazing platform um, i think it's given a lot of um talented um underrated queens the just do that they deserve that they weren't getting locally um so mm -hmm. I, I i really think that it's an amazing platform i really enjoy seeing um past cast members that are really doing something with the platform given to them i have um quite a few friends and family members um that are all have been on rupaul's drag race that are on rupaul's drag race live in las vegas and a couple that is is that is just filmed the new season as well. Um, so it's I, I'm I, I think it's amazing. I don't really like. I don't really maybe I, I'm not. I don't really see the bad. I don't I don't really see the bad in it. I know I see others' opinions online as far as you know the bad. Um, but I, I to me I just think it's all good for for whomever is is blessed enough to make it on the show. I think it's all good. Well, we're, we're grateful that RuPaul created such a great show. There's a few other new shows that are going to be popping up that might create an opportunity for a lot of people that might have their have negative opinions about the show. Mm -hmm. But there's some new shows that are going to be popping up that will be creating opportunities for a lot of different entertainers. Yeah, well, that's this amazing. Is, this, is, this is what I'm hearing. So right, we, right. Will, we will see until they, I, I know they're in development of writing mm -hmm. new shows. So, and I've been asked to be a judge for a couple of them, but we'll see how all this turns out. Well, good luck to you on that, for sure. Now, let's talk about Amari Lavish and your life with, um, I don't want to say his name wrong, your husband. Sorry. Brian? Brian. Okay. You you didn't say Brian in, 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 in your in your in your thing. Oh his okay. his stage name is Kamarion. Oh, okay. So He's an entertainer Brian, as let's, well. Let's talk about you and Brian. Now, as you know, on the like I said before, I, I'm, the reason I'm recapping a lot of this is because we watch what's happening on the internet. Okay. We're seeing a lot of the black masculinity about this top and bottom issue. I'm sure you've seen it. And of course. Yeah, when you and Brian met, how did you guys meet? So we we met like uh, like informally we met at, at Black Universe in 2011. Tariko Ross, he's my gay father. He's one of my gay fathers. Tariko Ross competed for Mr. Black Universe that year. And Brian was in Tariko's talent and I was in Tariko's talent. We didn't talk to each other. We didn't even know each other. Tariko was just like, son, I need you on my talent. I need you to be a fanboy. And, you know, it was like four or six fanboys. And that's it. We were just fanboys. Um, so fast forward to like a couple of weeks after Black Universe, um brian hit me up on facebook and he messaged me and he was just like hey weren't you one of the fanboys in tariko's talent 
And I was like, yes, I was. You know, who are you? And he was like, I was too. Didn't even know it. And I was just like, oh, okay. And literally, like, uh, he hates when I tell the story because I really was just like paying him dust. I was just like, okay. And that was it. And then it was just like the, how are you doing? How was your day? Then the good morning messages. And I'm like, looking at his profile, I'm like, this man is in Alabama. I'm in Florida. Like, I'm good. <laughs> and at that time, you know, I was not to, you know, sound big headed, but we, we have, we, we, we are, you know, in our own right, sometimes they consider us like, you know, gay celebrities, you know, especially when you're at the peak of your career in pageantry. And at that time, I was like one of the hottest newcomer boys out in 2011. <clears throat> um, I had just won Mr. Duval. <clears throat> I had just won Mr. Duval, newcomer, Mr. D Dumar International, to get it ready for Mr. Dumar. Um, so I was just like, OK, he's probably just another groupie, another fan. And, and the next thing out of his mouth is probably going to be like, oh, I do shows. Can you help me? So I really wasn't into dating male entertainers because that's how most of them, they try to befriend you. They act like they want you. The next thing, they, you know, oh, can I wear that outfit that you wore a couple of weeks ago? So um, I, I kind of was just like paying them off, you know, dusting them off. And, and then he was persistent. He really was. And so then I started going through his pictures and I was like, oh, he's kind of cute. And I just started really just messaging him back and, and really then starting the conversation and replying to him. And I wasn't really being short anymore. So that's how we okay. met. Now, let's talk about a, a few things because I, I, I want to, I'm, I'm trying to put in perspective, not just your relationship, is how the community around our relationships in general and what has landed you into this two-year marriage. You guys are married now, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you have a 12-year-old daughter and a seven-month-old son. Eight months now. Yeah. Eight months. Yeah. Now, let's, I want to talk about the hookup culture just for a minute. Okay. Not necessarily that I'm, I'm talking about you and Brian. I'm just talking about you know, sometimes when we go to these events or we go to these parties, we've seen people that maybe we've, we, we, we've seen on hookup apps such as Grindr or in the States, Jack and those other Craigslist and all those things there. Now, how do you feel about the fact that you met Brian, but did you ever ask him about being online? With, you yeah, know, when I met him back then, because again, I lived in Florida, so I wasn't trusting someone in, from Alabama, you know, and we, so <clears throat> to be honest with you, my whole, my, like my mindset was just to really, I mean, I don't know if I can cuss on here, um, but my mindset was just to really just hit it and quit it. <laughs> mm -hmm. <No>. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now let's, let's, let, I want to, because you, you said it perfectly. She stopped me. She told me to stop you there. So that was good. Um, let's talk about the children now. Mm -hmm. The seven, the eighth month old and the 12 year old. Mm -hmm. And you two, are you, are, are you guys Christians? We are. Yeah. Oh, okay. this. Because you know, I'm from Orlando. I was, I'm originally from Orlando. I grew up in okay. Florida, in Miami. Okay. Um, so I know most of the people from the States, you know, around that area would be Christians. We are. Now, what, I almost said it the wrong way. <laughs> are these, are these biological children? <laughs> so my daughter is, and our son, we had, we adopted our son. Oh. So, um, my daughter, I actually, when I met Brian, uh, my daughter was nine months old when I met him, you know, during those times. Um, and, and we talked for a few months and then um, a few months I went ahead and had him come here to Tampa and we, we, we had a good time. And so that's how we started. And so for two to three years, we were just, we did the long distance relationship thing. Um, and, and my daughter, the day that he came to Tampa, 
she was nine months old and she was spoiled. She, if someone held her, she would cry. If I left the room, she would cry. And um, being a Christian and 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 a child of God, I pick up I pick up signs and and God sent me a sign that morning and he reached for my daughter and she reached back out for him and she lets him help pick her up. And I was just like, that's not like her. Like, I, this is my daughter, like my child. Like if anybody pick her up or if I leave, she's going to cry. So I left the room to see, see if I was going to hear her cry and she didn't cry. And I was like, she must like you because that's not, Sorry, like that's not her. So that was my first sign. I was like, wow, like, okay, well, my daughter likes him. So, you know, let me continue to grow to like him. And um, so we did the long distance thing for three years. Like whenever I was booked out of town somewhere, I would, you know, send for him to meet me there. We'll meet up in whatever city and state I was going to be in. Um, and then finally, um, we decided to make it official and moved him here. Um, so over the years, he's always wanted to have kids. And I was against it because at this time my daughter was getting older, um, and I'm like, I'm not starting over because I like I I had my daughter from birth, um, so with my with my daughter um, I was in another relationship, and he and I planned to have kids, and so that's how I conceived my daughter, um, and you know we did the whole surrogacy thing from from birth, right out the hospital, my daughter came home with us. So, you know, I've already had all those experiences of the sleepless nights and the waking up, you know, every two hours. So as she got older and he wanted to have kids, I didn't want to start over. I'm like, I just don't want to start over. Like, that was hell. Um, but getting married, getting a house built, and then I had to, you know, realize I can't be selfish. Like, I have to give this man the opportunity because he's now, you know, vowed to spend the rest of his life with me. So it's only right that I do give in. And with our son, we had um, a friend of mine that I've known for many, many years ago, um, and she was pregnant, and she was going to give her baby up for an adoption, and she was going to an adoption agency, um, and she literally came, it was a secret, she, she came to my house right before, um, the day after Thanksgiving, um, to get some dressing and some ham, and she was, you know, I heard her talking to our other friend who was taking her to Colorado to um, the the agency she was going to go through, they house you throughout the rest of your pregnancy until you have the baby. And she was literally leaving two weeks after that date to go to Colorado um, to be housed until she had my son. And um, she told her friend who I know, she was like, <clears throat> um, she mentioned something about, you know, after I had the baby and I said, you're pregnant. And she was like, yes. And she was like, but I'm, you know, I'm not going to, um, keep it. She said, I'm going to give them up for adoption. And, um, I was just like, well, you know, we, you can, we should talk, you know, cause we're actually looking into having another baby. So we should really talk. And so she was like, are you serious? And I was like, well, yeah, we're, you know, we're, we're going to go the natural route again. <clears throat> but I said, you know, if you're already pregnant, you want to give your baby for adoption, we can talk. So we had a long talk and we talked with, uh, with my husband and <clears throat> um, we even met with the, the child's biological father and they came back over here to our house. They like, you know, toured our house and talked with us. And that's what I appreciated most about her, even though she was giving her, her baby for adoption, she still cared about the well-being of her unborn child. Mm -hmm. She literally did, like, she brought him here. They looked up, you know, looked at the house, you know, see where he'd be sleeping at and make sure we had room and, you know, and I've known her for about 15 years. So it wasn't anything personal, but this is her baby. Um, and so probably like about two or three days later, um, she called me and she said, um, Alex, she said, we want you all to adopt the baby. And, um, that's, that's, that's how it came about. And it's so, it's so ironic because people look at our son. Some people say he looks like Brian. <laughs> some people look, like, he looks just like you. He is, he's mine. So, you know. <laughs> well, you know, that's a wonderful story, Amari. Now, uh, you know, it's it's it, it touches me when 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 you know black people we've always taken care of each other. We mm -hmm. really have, even in the communities we fed people that we don't even really know in our community. If people just really understood how amazing the black community is with each other when things aren't, you know, at, at, concerning in certain certain ways. Whether we're it's about religion, 
or about work or lack of. And these things have, and it's not without the fact that we haven't been trying. Black people have been trying and doing for, like you said, years and decades. And now the opportunity has come for us to sort of make some um, headway and some decisions about things that we should have probably been doing from a long time ago. Mm -hmm. and, um, and you adopting a child and then having a 12 year old, I couldn't, I, I couldn't imagine having a 12 year old girl <laughs> in the house with a same sex couple without her little girlfriends coming over and this is my parents and how does that work um, Have you had that? we we've had it like of course uh, a a child only you know a child only um sees what they're taught mm -hmm. and we since day one i've always um taught my child to love all i don't teach her uh to see sexuality i've never taught her to see color so she doesn't see that so all she sees is um she has two dads like that's 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 what she sees and and now my daughter she knows who her biological mother is um now that she's gotten older i even let her go spend the night at her mom's house sometimes she takes her mom and her phone and everything so it took years to get to that point because i didn't want to confuse her at an early age um but growing up it was all about i have two dads but we did experience the first bit of kind of like um her getting picked on i think she was in like the third grade and um i was I, at that point, I was walking to the bus stop. <clears throat> the bus stop was on the corner of our house. And so one day she said, Dad, what's gay? And I said, well, what do you mean, what's gay? She said, because when um, when I got on the school bus, one of the boys said, oh, your dad's gay. So that was when I had to have the first conversation with her about the third grade, about what gay was, um, you know, for her to understand. Um, and she was just like, oh, so he's talking about my daddy? And so, you know, she was, then she was all mad then. Um, but now she's in a sixth grade. Now she's in a middle school. So now um, she has a voice. And so now she's more so a voice of reason. Uh, and I also feel like this is almost 2023. So I, 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 I'm praying my son is going to have it easier because gay is not the thing like it used to be back in the day. Like, oh, my God, you're gay. Like, oh, my God, you have your adopted. Oh, my God, you have two. So I'm praying when he's her age, it's going to be a thing in the past where he won't have to deal with what she is. Because like I know in middle school now, she just came home probably like two weeks ago. And she said that, um, what did she say about somebody, somebody had asked her, why does she have two dads? Um, one of her friends <clears throat> asked her, why does she have two dads? And she was like, I said, what did you say? She said, well, I told him because I got two dads and a mommy. You know, so mm -hmm. I said, well, yeah, you know, that's that's a good answer. You know, you're that just means that you're what? And she said, that means I'm more loved. And I mm -hmm. said, exactly. Um, you know, I've never told her, like, even with Brian, I've never, like, told her, like, she doesn't even call him dad. She calls him Brian. But <clears throat> when she introduces him, it's always this is my dad's or these are my dad's. And, and that was completely that's all on her own. That's amazing. That's amazing. You know. Amari, it's it's great when we can teach our children to open up to what um, the black community think is norm or what we're taught in the church. And we're now realizing that a lot of those things are propaganda or just things that have just been over exaggerated and mm -hmm. people have interpreted it the way they want it to be and to make things better for themselves or mm -hmm. to make them more accepted in society. But it's good that we're having this pushback now. Now, I wanna talk about one more thing about what the family structure here. Mm -hmm. You and Brian, um, when you go, to do you guys go to church we haven't been to church since before the pandemic mm -hmm. yeah but but we okay. yeah we were we were going okay. to church he both of us and our daughter mm -hmm. okay let's talk about you we get the stairs we get the stairs you know they look at us crazy <laughs> no <laughs> I, I i understand you know i you know i understand um let's talk about you now 
is Mr. Showman, the current reigning Mr. Showman. Now, let's talk about your proudest moment of entering any pageant. Which pageant are you the most proud of? Um, and the and they just did right by you as a contestant entering the contest. They fulfilled oh. all their obligations and you will never forget them. So I want to say not to, you know, <clears throat> sound like cliche because I'm raining, but in, in the title is National Showman. So that's actually the that will it will be it will be that it will, I'm, I'm 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 proud of all of my accomplishments like every pageant that i've won i've won it like it it, it means something to me like winning um national showman i would say um this this means the most to me because it was my crossover pageant um not only just into the regular division it was you know we have um, unfortunately, we have where they consider the black pageants and the white pageants. Mm -hmm. I don't see that. I see pageants are pageants, but you know that's how the community divides pageants, and 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 predominantly they will consider national showman as a white pageant, um, like they would you know continental or U.S. of A. or you know, mm -hmm. um, so that would be it would be national showman because I feel like I, I broke down a barrier for our community that they probably didn't really think that could happen. And I was, I'm not even the first African-American national showman. You have Christopher Iman, you have Monty St. James um, that has won as well. Um, but me being the current, I, I know already, I've had more African-Americans message me about national showman than I believe they've ever had competed before. So that was, that's definitely a goal of mine is to bridge that gap with the African-American community um, and national showmen so they um, can get that negative stigma out of their mind. Okay, this is something that I think is, is, is controversial in a sense. And I wanna talk about this because it, 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 it's relevant mm -hmm. and the girls are talking about it online. A lot of the female um, contestants in the female audience, um, whether they're, whatever pronoun under they, they're under, They've been talking about the male, when they're watching the men pageantry. Now, of course, we're hearing now about the sexualized part of male pageantry. Mm -hmm. And then we're hearing about the non-masculinity of maybe some of the male contestants, mainly when they're walking in swimsuits or even regular suits. They don't, because you know, of course the gay community, back in the day we thought the Marlboro man was butch and that's what all men really should look like. And you got right, a mustache right. and boots and a cowboy hat on your butch and that's what they think of. Now, have you ran into, I'm, I'm sure you've heard the talk about men walking in the pageants. Yes, definitely. Um, I've heard it. Um, I mean, I I feel that if you're doing a Mr. Pageant, of course you should present yourself as a Mr. I, 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 I think that you have to go to, that's all about knowing your system. And you have to really go and compete to where you know you will fit in at. So if you're more of the, on the feminine side, you should go to a pageant like National Showman, Gay You a Survey, pageants that, you know, when you are a little more feminine, you're not gonna really get a lot of backlash. But I really more so, experience that more so on the black circuit because on the black circuit that's when you have to be masculine you have to walk a certain kind of way you can't do this you can't do that so and, and i get it you are presenting yourself as the mister so i agree to a certain extent where you should pr still present yourself as a man now that i do agree with i don't think that you, sh you should just be up there just fagging out during formal wear you should present yourself as a debonair man. Okay. So if you feel that's hard for you to do, then learn your systems and know where you will best be, where you will fit best at. 
<laughs> okay. Now I want to talk about something else she wrote here. Let's talk about you. How do you feel about trans men entering a competition with you? In, in, in any of the any of the male pageants. So let's just say that. I don't, I don't men, really care because we only know they're trans men because they told us. Nine out of 10, a lot of the trans men, you can't even tell they're trans men. So if they didn't volunteer the information, we wouldn't know anyway and we'll still compete. Because that's what it's going to make them. It's going to make them not tell that they're trans and they just do the pageant. And then what? So just because we know they're trans men, that shouldn't say, oh, you can't. he can't do the pageant. He can just go do a male impersonator pageant. Well, then why would a trans man go do an MI pageant when that is male impersonator? When at this point, they're no longer impersonating a male. They are a male. Okay. So me now, personally, I don't have a problem with it. Okay. Let's talk about you now. Because we're, 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 we're winding up here. You, you've, done really, you've done really well. You've done really <laughs> well here. Thank too. you. So um, let's talk about your journey as Mr. National Showman. Just no. national showman. It's not even a mister because the showman, mm -hmm. it, it, it takes out the mister. So oh, it makes okay. it even easier. Just national showman. Okay, national showman. Mm -hmm. National showman Amari Lavish. Now I want to see the crown and the and the and the and the thing, the 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 medal, because I thought I loved it. I thought they were beautiful. So I wanted to, you to show it to us if you don't mind. Uh, uh, the crown is out there. I didn't I didn't want to okay. wear the crown. Oh well, that's good. That's good. That so, is beautiful. Who designed it? To be honest with you, I don't know. Because oh. they had a new jeweler this year. I know who the previous jeweler was, but I'm not sure who the new jeweler is. But it's absolutely beautiful. Mm -hmm. And then this is uh, my sash. It's going to be beaded before I give up the pageant. It will be beaded and sewn. I mean, it has to be. So I'm oh. actually sending this off um, next month. I got a couple of walks to do this month. So I can't risk it being gone. And I have a walk, actually I have a walk, two walks, two weekends in a row, next weekend and the weekend after that. But mm -hmm. so that is it. That's amazing. So what are you doing now? What are you doing now? Are you learning new music, making new costumes? Yes, yes, yes. I'm learning new music. I'm, um, I'm, I'm actually, I'm working on a Lil Nas X mix. So yeah, I'll just put it out there. Um, I've never, I've never, ever, ever done any of his songs ever. All, even going back from... Old Town Road. I've never, uh, but National Showman is it, pushing me as an entertainer because my audiences have changed. Um, uh, and not changed, my audiences, um, my son dropped something. <laughs> my audiences um, has not only not changed, but they, my, it has increased. Like I have a different audience now that's watching me and, and even booking me. Um, so my, my song selections are, had to be more diverse. So Lil Nas X is one I'm, I'm working on. So yeah, I'm working on that. I'm working on new costumes as well, because of course, you, you know, can't repeat stuff and things like that throughout the year. So that helps keep the, keep the, the, the closet growing. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm preparing for, I'm hosting the People Choice Awards December the 30th in Nashville, Tennessee. Oh. So I'm excited to be, um, had to have been selected as the host for that um, December 30th. So, of course, working on my attire for that. Um, and then gearing up for Christmas is my daughter's birthday is February and my son's birthday is March. So I have two birthdays back to back to prepare for a 12 year old birthday and a one year old birthday. So that's pretty much all that I'm working on personally and professionally. Well, you know, I want to say Amari Lavish, you've been very entertaining. You've been quite honest. I could tell when you relaxed and a lot of it was more from your heart, which was amazing. Of course, definitely. She threw, she threw two thumbs up and said, well, we got it. So I was like, okay. I think, you know, because, you know, I, I didn't want to just come right out and just be bold with the question. Oh, I don't mind. Like I said, I'm an open book. I've always been open and transparent. I mean, from day one, from my relationship, um, to my imprisonment, to my kids, because I always feel like my story can hopefully inspire others. 
um, and and to know that the test is only just a testament. That's all it is. Um, and, and and most of it comes from my from me going to prison. Um, I went to prison in 2013, and and that really that one year away it changed my life. Like it that, and it was needed. Um, and so just being away for that year, it let me know I couldn't be without my child. Like I, I wouldn't ever be without my child, like ever again, to leave my daughter for a year. Um, she was in good care, of course, with my ex-lover at the time and my mom and all that. But um, that right there, it let me know, you know, it's not worth it. You know, it's, it's, it's best to get an honest job, a nine to five, live your life. If you got to live paycheck to paycheck for a little while, that's what you got to do. The fast money is not where it's at. Um, and that's why, you know, today, even with my husband and I getting our house built, um, that was one of another big, a big accomplishment for, for the both of us, um, just coming from where I've came from and, and coming from where he's come from as well. Cause he has, his story is pretty unique as well. Like my husband literally moved here with nothing but a duffel bag. Like that's all just a duffel mm-hmm. bag of clothes. And that was it. So I, I always, you know, pride uh, myself on just letting him know how proud of him I am. You know, he's been here eight years and in eight, she, in eight years, he got a career. He's had another child, has a home built. Um, so it can be done. It can be done. Well, you know, this is amazing. I didn't, I, I, I didn't want to add, I, I was going to ask you, I saw when we talked, I mean, when I think it was brought up in conversation about you being in prison and mm-hmm. I didn't really because we had spoken to Paula Mosley and she had a prison story about being a trans woman in prison which was very intense and sort of very informative and opened our eyes to a lot mm-hmm. and of course a lot of the pageant queens have done some time or another for whether they're trying to get their silicone their hormones or just trying to live in general, you know, or pay for the costumes or whatever the situation Mm -hmm. is. And um, we wanted to focus more with you about the family and the pageant, the male pageantry, because we thought it was, I will do a a catch up show with you and Brian down the road. So we can talk about your, your prison time and the family, the homes that you built and how you said that he's come with one duffel bag and turned his life around and things are real good. And this is an amazing thing. And the fact that when I watch your stuff online, I can see that you're very focused and very guided in a, in a good sense because I don't just add people's stuff for no reason. Mm-hmm. My agent, even though she's a she's an old older lady, she's very smart, mm-hmm. and she always says, "You are smarter than me," because I know good things when I see them, mm-hmm. and I I always look for the underlining dramas first before I do anything. So I already knew a little bit about you before, but I didn't want to focus on what she wanted the show to be about because Mm -hmm. the black community is talking now and we have the ear and we need to make sure that they understand your story and coming from a black perspective and coming from uh, a black trans woman and us moving and grooving in the right directions. The fact that we're talking is a good thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, so I wanna say congratulations, National Showman. Thank you. Um, And I wanna say congratulations on the new house and the fact that you and Brian are raising these children with, you know, with good values and an open mind about mm-hmm. whatever it is that the family in, in together is going to go through down the road and what the family is going through now. It's really important to show children that we are all the same, regardless exactly. of what race or nationality we are. It's Christmas time, and like you said, the birthdays are coming up, New Year's Eve Mm -hmm. is coming up, and I know um, you're going to be very busy, and I appreciate you letting me share your stuff. There's no motive behind us sharing your stuff. We share it because we are looking to show other people like us that we all can do good things to help each other. 
and make our voice louder, heard louder. So I just want to say, Amari, thank you so much for doing thank this show you. for us today. Yes. And I want to close with I want to close with this. Let me say this to my audience. I just want to say thank you, Amari Lavish, for uh -huh. coming on today, National Showman for being on the show and teaching us and educating us here at Pronoun TV and the Stephanie Stevens show, the real life reality, reality of mm -hmm. what black families go through. And now that we're all online talking to each other, this is an amazing thing. And mainly with the gay community. And it's about time. It's about time that we start talking, sharing our ideas and sharing mm -hmm. our resources and just being together, talking, communicating. Networking and networking, definitely. Networking, mm -hmm. yes. And so I want to say to you, Amari, the, can you give us some closing on what you think the challenges are for Black entrepreneurs? What should they be trying to do? Black entrepreneurs and maybe Black gay entrepreneurs, because I see us doing a lot of pageants and all these things. But when you don't own the clubs and you don't own the venues, what do you do so you can have a sustainable career, open doors for other people, and have an income to come into the Black families oh. that can build Black communities? Um, so what can they do to, as far as helping build? Mm -hmm. Well, what, what, what's your advice to Black entrepreneurs, mainly gay Black entrepreneurs? So my advice, I will have to really say to just to Black entrepreneurs, um, is, is to one, put your customers first. Put your customers first. Um, put yourselves in our shoes because um, they are customers as well. Even though they're entrepreneur, they patronize other businesses, even if it's just to go buy a hamburger from McDonald's. They're a customer. And because um, I don't like to um, see entrepreneurs that are rude or being nasty and, and, and things like that, because that's not going to your business is not going to grow um, and it, it's not going to succeed. You know, customer service. Put, I'm, I'm very big on customer service. I have a customer service background, so I'm, I'm very big on customer service. Um, and, and, and for more so a message to them is, is, is to save. Like that's really to, to just our community in a, in a whole. Um, save because we never know where our next dollar is coming from. Even, even as an entrepreneur, whatever it is that you're selling, you never know when the next product is going to be sold. Uh, so it's, it's very important to, it's, it, and I feel like in the black community to save, I feel they're so busy trying to keep up with the Joneses. Um, if they, they make a thousand dollars cause they know they get paid next week, 900 of it is spent on clothes and jewelry. Um, and they're, yeah. oh, I got a hundred dollars to last me until the next week, but you never know. You never know when the next dollar is going to come in. You never know. Even if you're not an entrepreneur, you don't know if that job is going to lay you off. Um, so that would be my advice. And I, my my kids, they, they're going to close. They're going to just wave at you because my daughter's just each itching to wave. She keeps hearing her name. Okay. <laughs> um, <Hi. but> <laughs> Sorry, you come and wave. Yeah. Uh, but that would be definitely my, my advice. Um, so just wave. This is Miss Stephanie Stevens. Um, so, <laughs> so these are my two munchkins here. So that is Soray. <laughs> and that is hi, Ray. <laughs> And he's having How are you? So hi. say hi, 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 hi. So we talked about you too, mister. You don't say Hello. hi. He's one. Of hi. <laughs> okay. Oh. <laughs> so what's this? Um, so yeah, so that would definitely be my advice to any entrepreneur and to just to, to the black community as a whole. Uh, I'm, I'm big on savings. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, Amari, thank you so much for introducing me into your life and saying hello and being nice to me for never meeting me and opening me up to the world of male pageantry, the family of a, of a gay black family um, 
raising children, something that we don't see on the on, on the day to day. And it's great that you have created, you and Brian have created this family structure with a home and understand that of course, in the past you made mistakes, you've moved forward and you're mm -hmm. making a better life for you and your children. Okay. And this is amazing. And then yet you're still doing something that you love, the pageants. Yes. And this is why you're a national showman. Um, and I just, I just wanted to say thank you. And I take my wig off to you <laughs> <laughs> to say, you're doing, you're doing great things. And I'm not just saying that to say it. You really are. It. And for you to have caught our eye online means that you're doing amazing things. So thank to you, you and your husband, I congratulate you on your relationship and, you know, your home and your children. And I just want to just say thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much for you all to even have recognized little old me. I appreciate it. Um, I use social media in a positive light. It's, it's not all about negative. You know, I, I like to use social media in a positive light, um, you know, showing off my kids and my husband and my family. And, and obviously it, it, it catches attention. Um, and, and I think it's in our community, the world it, needs to see something that the world this needs to see. Something the world needs to see for them on a constant know. basis. We, we need to stop it. hiding and you're doing, you're doing great. We can do it. We can do it. So many of our people in our lives, are, they feel like, oh, I'll never have kids. Oh, I'll never, never say never. It can, it can happen. I never thought I would have any kids, you know, to have one and then to have two. And, and, and a little secret with you, um, before it gets aired, we're working on a third one and, oh. and that's it. So, <laughs> so it, it can happen. It can happen. So what is the, when do you give up your crown? So I relinquished my title September the 16th in Kissimmee, Florida. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to take a, I'm going to take a, a break after that. Cause um, we, we have talked about expanding the family. Um, and so I'm going to just focus on that. Cause if we're, we're, we're planning on, on um, expanding our family next year. So by the time, hopefully by the time I relinquish the title, it'd be about time to, bring on the new edition and um it'll be time for me to take a break from the nationals i'm gonna take about a year break from the nationals i'll still go and compete you know locally and things like that pride pageants and stuff like that but it, uh, it'll be time to just take me a break raise these kids and still do what i love to do return to certain systems that form are still performing but competing takes a lot the way that i like to compete it takes a lot of money time and effort and giving up this pageant in September, I'll just ride the rest of that year out. And I think I'll be doing something like the end of 2024. Mm. So on that note, I want to just say thank you so much for doing this show for us today. Anytime. And I want to just say thank you to the audience for watching. This is Mr. Amari Lavish, National Showman. Um, He's the current reigning, and he has shared his story with us here today on Pronoun TV and the Stephanie Stevens Show, and we appreciate his honesty and his insight into things that are changing, and we're talking now. So I just want to say thank you so much, Amari Lavish, and you have a blessed day, it was and my own. thank you to the kids, and good night, National Showman. Good night. See you again. Bye. Bye.